Hello. Uh, welcome to the me this meeting of Arts Recreation Community Policies Committee, meeting number 02-2019. I'm calling the meeting to order. Uh, we have an agenda in front of us. Um, although, does anyone have any additions or subtractions? Okay. So we have a mover and a seconder for approval of the agenda, please. Moved by Councillor Hill, seconded by Councillor Osanek. Um, this is the way we should have done it. I take it there are no additions or subtractions. So all those in favor of the agenda passes. Um, three, confirmation of minutes of um, Thursday, November 22nd committee meeting. And uh, well, we'll do them separately. Yep. Yeah. And uh, Councillor Sanic moves adoption. Councillor Stroud, would you like to second that? Yes. Yeah, you can second for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any corrections? Seeing none. All those in favor? That's passed. Um, The minutes of the special ARC committee meeting on Thursday, January 17th be approved. Mover, uh, Councillor Hill, second by Councillor Sanek. All those in favor? That's passed. Any disclosure of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Moving on. Delegations? Seeing none. Briefings? We have two. Oh. Okay, good. Okay, um, the briefings. The first one is 6A is Colleen Wigginton. We'll speak to the committee about the implications associated with establishing a legal wall adjacent to Douglas Fir Park. Thank you. And, and I'm actually going to defer that briefing to my colleague, Danica Lougheed, who's here this evening uh, to speak on behalf of this initiative. Danica joined us in the fall as our manager of arts and sector development, and uh, she's going to go over to the podium. Good evening. The purpose of our report is to outline for Council the implications associated with establishing the city-owned retaining wall on the Rideau Crest property adjacent to Douglas Fleur Park as a legal wall for graffiti art and street art. This report has been prepared in a response to a motion passed by Council at its regularly scheduled meeting held on June 6, 2017 that directed staff to look at how that might, how that might work based on interest received that has been expressed by the community and more specifically, by representatives from the Friends of the Kingston Inner Harbour Group, who successfully organized two community-led events that use the retaining wall as a place where local artists created murals. Before we get into the presentation, we just wanted to highlight some key terminology that is found throughout the report. Street art, as defined in the Public Art Master Plan, is an urban style of temporary public art that is found on walls, sidewalks, and roadways that is sanctioned and permitted. Important to understand as it relates to street art is, is the distinction, distinction between sanctioned and unsanctioned art in public space. Unsanctioned art in public space is illegal, which is known as graffiti, which is any kind of image or text painted onto buildings or property, usually by spray paint. Tagging is also illegal, which is often a signature or image and is a form of communication that serves the purpose of marking territory. Sanction art in public spaces through the creation of platforms like a legal wall, create space for artistic expression and recognize street art and graffiti art, terms that are often used interchangeably as a valid art form. In the context of sanctioned street art, graffiti art and, street, and graffiti art, they are applied by standard paints, including aerosols, and, are art, and is artwork that can range from bright graphic images to stylized symbols. Commonly recognized artwork in public spaces are murals, which are typically created by commission or through a facilitated program. Sanctioned street art requires collaboration and partnerships between businesses, government, and artists in order to leverage this type of artistic expression in a meaningful way. These are just some examples of un unsanctioned art that does include graffiti as seen in, on, on the train, as well as some tagging that you'll see on the left-hand side. These are two examples of sanctioned street art in the form of a commissioned mural, which is the top image, 
and a legal wall, which is the bottom image. The mural is, one of, is by one of the world's leading graffiti artists who created this mural for the 2016 Rio Olympics. The graffiti wall below is located in Ottawa and is one of three legal graffiti walls that are self-regulated by the community and part of its street art and mural program. Artists are able to go and use this wall at any time to create their artwork. These are some additional uh, examples of murals that just demonstrate how diverse art and public spaces can be in terms of the art itself and how it can animate a city's street and neighborhoods. The top image is in Mexico City, where public murals with historical significance have been a part of the city landscape for many years. The bottom left is in Hamilton, that as a city has leveraged its dynamic street art scene as a tourist attraction. And the bottom right is a photo of stencil graffiti artwork on a wall in California. So as you can see, there are a variety of street art and graffiti art forms that are able to be shared with the public through the establishment of designated and sanctioned public space for the artist to work. As some additional background for our report, the Public Art Master Plan was approved by Council in July 2014, and central to the plan is a desire to position Kingston as, as a community that is known as a hub of creative placemaking, that includes an innovative public art program that recognizes and builds on the city's diverse history, engages its community, and inspires its future leaders. The Public Art Master Plan identifies five main areas of focus that includes temporary art, street art, and public art platforms. Of the five main areas of focus, this priority area is intended as a way to develop opportunities for more diverse forms of artistic expression in civic spaces, places, and neighborhoods. That includes temporary installations, but also street art and mural programs. A recent example of temporary public art in Kingston is, is this exhibit here titled Paved Paradise that features the work of local photographers and evokes themes of nature, the outdoors, and the natural beauty of Kingston and surrounding area. This installation was mounted in summer 2018 and the selected images were installed in, in, an, in an exterior framing structure next to the parking lot at Brock and Ontario Streets facing City Hall. This high traffic area is at the edge of Kingston's historic downtown and is a hub of activity during the spring, summer, and fall. As the city's public art program continues to grow, there has been strong community interest in seeing opportunities expand for street art to be created by artists and experienced by the public, and that barriers that prevent this type of artistic expression are removed. Presently, any artist group or organization in Kingston that wishes to create street art must apply for an exemption to the property standards bylaw, specifically section 417, which states, Written slogans and graffiti on the exterior of any building, wall, fence, or structure shall be prohibited, including painted or chalked titles or messages. This was the approach that was uh, needed to be taken by the Friends of the Inner Harbor Group in 2014 and 2017 when they organized On the Wall, an arts festival that successfully used the retaining wall, which is made up of 23 concrete pa panels and adjacent to Douglas Fleur Park, as a place where local artists working with community members created murals. On the Wall aimed to democratize urban art in the city of Kingston and celebrate creativity by transforming the waterfront park into a lively public art venue where citizens and tourists alike could watch artists at work from the beginning to completion of their unique contemporary art projects. It is a result of this experience that representatives of the Friends of the Kingston Inner Harbor Group have expressed a desire to see the retaining wall continue to be used in a similar way to present and celebrate the work of local artists in their community. And these are just some examples of the artwork that, was that can be found on the retaining wall uh, adjacent to Douglas Fleur Park. Legal walls, like the one we are proposing, that feature street art and mural programs, offer an alternative form of expression that can help discourage tagging and other forms of illegal graffiti making, while providing a space for artists and communities to express themselves freely in a way that fosters urban regeneration. So, Part of this, part of our recommendation in our report is that the City of Kingston leads a 10-month pilot project to create a community-regulated wall for street art. Cultural services staff will manage and monitor the pilot project that will further be supported by the development of a clear internal and external communications plan to help educate staff, stakeholders, the public, and artists about the purpose and acceptable use of the legal wall. Staff will also evaluate the pilot project at its conclusion, and the results will be shared with Council and will also be used to assess the need to develop an integrated street art plan as a component of the City of Kingston Public Art Master Plan as a mechanism through which to support le making legal walls more permanent. 
So the images I have up here are just three examples of cities, uh, Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal, which was, were included in your report, um, that, how, that our examples where integrated street art plans, mural programs, and graffiti management plans have been implemented. I just wanted to share um, some quick highlights on the type of street art platforms that can be developed through this work. The top images of Toronto uh, is, of, is in Toronto, and it's of Street Art Toronto, which is an innovative program designed specifically for streets and public places. Initiated in 2012 as an integral part of the city's graffiti management plan, START has been successful in reducing graffiti vandalism and replacing it with vibrant, colorful, community-engaged street art. The program also assists private property owners to facilitate, to create murals if they encounter recurring graffiti vandalism. START is managed as part of the city's graffiti management plan and the program values the importance of community engagement. The bottom right image is again of Ottawa and is one of uh, the city's five graffiti, street art and mural related programs. Each of these programs targets a specific goal, whether that is city beautification, crime prevention, or providing space for creative expression. Ottawa also offers a business improvement cost sharing program that is designed to help assist businesses that are targets for graffiti and tagging. Neighborhoods that are heavily targeted may also apply for support to the city's crime prevention program called Painted Up that provides funding to hire youth mural artists to create murals in highly targeted areas. Ottawa also has three legal graffiti walls where mural and street artists have the opportunity to experiment with the medium. These are also self-regulated, uh, but the city will step in to paint over any mural that receives a complaint, which is the model that we're proposing for Kingston's legal wall. And finally, the bottom left image is of Montreal, whose program does include a series of legal and authorized walls across the city, and also supports activities and programs aimed at children and youth and at graffiti removal. So here's just a snapshot of the Legal Wall Street Art Pilot Project, which identifies the 10-month period that, will, that it will be open for usage and the goal of the project, which is to create a unique platform for art in Kingston and to promote street art as a component of the City of Kingston Public Art Master Plan. Our timelines for the pilot project begin in Q2 2019 with the opening of the wall in July 2019. The project will conclude in April 2020 with a report to council on the results of the pilot project in Q2 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions from the committee? Council Hill. Thank you. Is the, is the hope that uh, that um, this is the kind of program that would uh, expand to other areas of the city eventually, so that, uh, presuming, for example, the BIA is, was, was more welcoming of it. Yes, I mean, I think as a pilot project, we're looking primarily to see how this wall is going to be used by artists in the area, and then hopefully that can act as sort of a, um, a testing ground to see if there are other legal walls that we would like to open up in the city of Kingston and also it can potentially expand to a larger program that does look at things like Ottawa has been doing in terms of working with businesses to create murals on their properties. So in, in terms of the surrounding uh, uh, communities, so I know there's a couple of condominiums in that area and mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Rideau Crest home is there. Mm -hmm. You know, potentially at least there might be some initially some over enthusiastic folks that don't get on the wall and might want to get on those walls. Is there, did I read somewhere in here that there was a program to kind of address uh, issues where neighbors are getting tagged, maybe because of the enthusiasm for this program? In terms of, you mean neighbors to the wall, essentially right, in the area? Right. Um, I mean, the way that graffiti is currently managed now is through the bylaw, and that mm -hmm. has not changed, and, and no, nothing within this proposal is really meant to address that. However, there is research that does show that, you know, the creation of murals and street art and graffiti art does tend to reduce graffiti and tagging on the on the wall, but also in the in the general area. So I appreciate that. But if, if uh, we did uh, start to see some additional mm -hmm. damage being done, yep. we would consider maybe, uh, I would hope at least, give some consideration to assisting uh, 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 local folks, right? Okay, just finish what you're saying. Yeah. I have to recognize. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> finish what you're going to say. That's it. Yeah. Through you, Mr. I want to take a moment to address that because we have had a number of conversations in the lead up to this report. We've been actively 
uh, engaging with the downtown BIA and the Kingston police and other stakeholders around sort of trends to do with graffiti more broadly. And as the report um, indicates, the plan is to, through our communications process, also reach out to local property owners. And it'll be our responsibility as cultural services as we're monitoring the program to also monitor what might be referred to as spillage, as you're describing. And in that case, we'll have to work out as part of our procedures with the pilot project that we're connecting with the bylaw offices and uh, the Kingston Police is needed to make sure that that kind of thing doesn't get out of hand. Uh, anecdotally, though, um, the the walls as or the murals as they were painted in 2017 have been in place now for over a year and a half, and I think that we've already been able to see uh, how this the wall is performing, and we haven't necessarily seen that kind of spillage that you're referring to. So, I mean, that is one of the things that this pilot project is meant to give us an indication of is does providing this kind of legal space encourage or focus that kind of activity? And that's one of the things we'll have to be assessing. And I guess that's just sort of my last question is that the space itself, it, it's perfect, but it is a bit out of the way. And I, I wonder, are artists satisfied with uh, sort of the numbers of people that really get to see their work? I mean, I think from um, the history of using the wall as a, as a space for, for street art has generated a lot of um, public attention and awareness through the festival that was coordinated by Friends of the Inner Harbor. That neighborhood specifically is quite artistic in itself and has a lot of um, awareness and support of artistic activity. So I, I hope that it will be sufficient to the artists. Um, there also will be, as Colin mentioned, um, a strong communications plan to support this program that will not only raise awareness of the usage of the wall, but actually the artists who are using it and, and the potential and sharing information for people to go and visit the space. Yeah. Uh, others, uh, Councillor Sani? Thank you very much for your presence, especially all those pictures. Um, for the project that was last summer at the bottom of Brock in Ontario Street, is that coming back this year? I don't know if it was because of the election last summer, but I wasn't even aware of it. I would have liked to have seen those photos. So is it coming back and do we advertise it or how do we advertise that it's down there? Yeah, well, that was a council direction uh, last summer to uh, look at that public a space for public art project. And yes, we have plans to bring it back in 2019. Um, in last summer, sort of, were the, it was the early days of the public art program getting off the ground. Um, so we did do communications and awareness, and we had a launch event where the local artists who uh, had artwork featured in the, the exhibition were also in attendance. Uh, but we will be planning to do that this year and uh, share the information with you. Yeah. Yes, it will be. Yes. Anyone else on the council on the committee? No, not seeing that. Um, So we have, um, that's the end of the questions, thank you, but I think you're right back up again, because um, uh, it says you are. <laughs> yes, you and Trisha Baldwin, but I don't see her. Trisha's right over there. Oh, there she is, okay. So this is um, a briefing by Danica Lockheed. Lockhead, Lockhead, excuse me, and Trisha Baldwin on Professional Development Working Group. Thank you. The Professional Development Working Group of the City of Kingston Arts Advisory Committee was given the mandate to research, identify, and develop professional development opportunities relevant to the arts community. The working group was to identify specific actions and activities that may recommend to, that they recommend to ensure that individual artists and arts organizations are provided with access to additional professional development opportunities that are meaningful, relevant, and effective. This report is incredibly thorough, and I'm very pleased to introduce Trisha Baldwin, who was a member of this working group, to, to provide a briefing on the report. Thanks, Danica. Good evening, everyone. As Danica mentioned, um, this is, uh, we were part of the Arts Advisory Committee and um, this project was sanctioned by City Council to research, identify and develop professional development opportunities. And we had the most amazing committee. It was a really diverse committee. It was culturally diverse, age diverse, and um, people from very different disciplines, and um, a very, very productive and curious um, committee. So 
I was just, uh, we, we felt great working together and we had these really wonderful um, in-depth discussions, but I think the diversity of the committee really helped us um, define um, a very exciting um, vision for professional development um, for Kingston. And we decided, well, let's work from a factual background. So we came up with a very comprehensive research um, approach and we did an arts community um, research survey where individual artists and arts workers could participate in um, talking about what would be meaningful um, professional development for them. Um, we did field research on existing local professional development opportunities that are already part of uh, the Kingston art scene. And then we did really extensive field research on existing national and international practices for Western-based, Indigenous, and culturally diverse arts workers. And that was really interesting work. So why professional development? Why we felt it was really important for the city of Kingston was to retain and stimulate arts talent, to address the needs of Kingston's indigenous artists as per the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's recommendations, address the needs of Kingston's culturally diverse artists, enhance market development, and this is very important, to ensure the sustainability and vitality of Kingston's arts sector and community. And this is especially important because, as you know, the world's going through a big churn. There's a big churn in the arts community and the arts environment. And whether it's virtual reality and augmented reality to changing um, audience patterns, there's going to be a big change in the environment and we want Kingston to be really prepared and excited uh, about these opportunities and challenges. When we um, narrowed down what the key success factors were for professional development, we talked about the importance, uh, the importance of access for people so that people had access to professional development opportunities. The importance of high quality partnerships, because there's a lot of interesting programs and why not partner with some of these great programs rather than invent everything ourselves. So it's kind of a combination of partnerships and, um, and, and new programs specific to Kingston. Very flexible uh, delivery. Some people like online, some people like um, in person. So we wanted to develop a lot of flexible delivery options for professional development and a centralized coordinating hub. So I'm just going to summarize our recommendations and then um, talk about them individually. Specifically, the Professional Development Working Group recommends the leadership role of the City of Kingston and Kingston Arts Council in coordinating the professional development strategy for art sector development. So this is really important that we develop as a city a strategy for professional development for arts workers. The second recommendation, the creation of a, a $25,000 annual professional development funding program funded by the City of Kingston and administered by the Kingston Arts Council, and the development of a human resource plan for the support of professional development initiatives supported by the City and or the, uh, the uh, Kingston Arts Council. One of the big things that we wanted to talk about is that um, the cultural services um, and the city of Kingston will be developing a very important cultural plan. In 2010, there was a real game changer of a cultural plan that was um, developed. And so for the next cultural plan, we wanted to do a lot of background research that could provide um, some food for thought for that cultural plan. So we wanted this report to be a building block for the Kingston cultural plan for the future, specifically for Kingston art sector development. And we, we thought in lofty terms and we thought in very practical terms. So you'll note that all these recommendations are doable. So we started with a very easy first step. Create an online professional development resource listing for cultural workers in Kingston. And this could be housed by the Kingston Arts Council or uh, on the Cultural Services website. But to, we did a lot of listing of all the, the professional development opportunities. And so these could be actually list, listed and accessed in a centralized place. Create a professional development funding program as I mentioned, with um, a $25,000 grant program administered by the Kingston Arts Council and funded by the City of Kingston. And it was a small amount, $25,000. We, we kept it modest. 
we wanted to educate the arts community on technological innovations of the arts. And this is also a very practical um, recommendation because the Festival of Digital and Live Arts, the FOLDA uh, Festival is in Kingston and is there to actually develop knowledge of working with um, technology, virtual reality, augmented reality, and um, to train professionals in the field in integrating this into live performance. So we have um, the most wonderful opportunity in Kingston to do that, but it's very important to do that. And it's not just for technology for technology's sake, but it is there to develop young audiences with technology that is relevant and exciting to young audiences as well. And to have young audiences participate in the creation of the art with technology that really excites them. Again, we mentioned the cultural um, plan and have this um, research as the basis um, for recommendations for art sector development. We also wanted to create a Kingston mentor program. And this would be a Kingston-based structured mentor program for artists and other creative arts. And um, that was a, a practical um, approach, and this has actually been very successful in other cities. There's also the Talent to Lead program, but this would make sure that that, that mentorship and that one-on-one -on -one relationship and development can happen. And they talk about professional development and mentorship being one of the most successful and game-changing um, types of uh, professional development that can happen. And we have so many great artistic leaders here that would be happy to share their time um, for emerging artists artists and emerging arts workers. So we talked about that. Um, established Kingston Arts Learning Labs. As adults, we don't like being talked at, like I'm talking to you right now. Uh, we actually like participating and having conversation and that experiential learning is actually the thing that changes us most. So to develop arts learning labs where there are fabulous conversations and learning over time and people can go back, try something and come back and say, well, I tried this, but this didn't work. But to have that community of learning through arts learning labs and very progressive arts learning labs would be really wonderful. One of the important recommendations that we wanted to talk about was reaching underserved artistic communities. These are racialized communities, the indigenous community, the Franco-Ontario community, to ensure that professional development is considered for these groups and um, welcomed as well. And these are non-mainstream creatives that may not self-identify as artists, but are actually cultural workers. And that's a very important um, point um, to stress. Um, we also recommend the continuation of the cross-cultural encounters and equity convening cultural conversations. It was um, started by Danica. And to continue with that, because that's um, equity um, and the arts um, are in important and great bedfellows to have, because we believe that the arts are great change agents for society. And uh, to have that understanding really helps the arts really have a great influence on the fabric of our society for a fair and wonderful society. Um, one of the barriers that we found in our research was um, people want to do professional development, but they were constrained by um, not having access to facilities. And so we thought, well, why don't we get um, together with the community and figure out facility donation so that each um, major facility could actually donate their space for a specific um, amount of time for professional development of Kingston's artists. And it could be um, the Grand, the Isabel, um, uh, the, well, there's many, um, the Spire is another example, but we would be asking for donations so that we would be able to really help um, Kingston artists take that next step, take chances, have that creative incubator um, that Kingston can be. So that was the facility resource program. We wanted um, to explore collaborations with other existing learning programs and partners, such as the BAMP Center has an arts leadership um, program, so that the ability to partner with them and send some of um, Kingston's emerging best and brightest to that and talk to people across the country and have that great experience. 30 seconds. And bring that back. So, thank you very much.
Um, I'm just going to end it with that, but I just wanted to say um, thank you to our committee because our committee worked extremely hard, put many, many hours of research and hard work into this, and we're so excited about this because we've got a great arts community and we want to make it superb. So thank you very much for your time. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Yes. Councillor Stroud. Thank you. Um, it, uh, a lot of what you said sounded like excellent work and great ideas and for this development. And uh, it, it hinges, as I understand it, on uh, the involvement of, of, of artists, uh, Kings, Kingstonian artists. Yes. And I'm wondering uh, if it's a separate item or if it was part of the conversation. So how do you reach the emerging artists that may not be following the Kingston Twitter feed and the other ways that we do publicity. Is there any uh, strategy for outreach to the artists yes. themselves? We, we talked about our communities and um, really doing a lot of research or where we could reach them. So we talked about working with Kingston Immigration Partners as one example and um, having conversations with leaders within the Indigenous communities to make sure that the Indigenous communities had access and we were listening to what kind of professional development the Indigenous communities would like to have. So it's going to be a lot of conversations but we talked about not going through the mainstream at all times but we actually have to diversify our communication in our conversations. It was interesting when we looked at um, the research for this um, group called SABAC in um, Toronto that was uh, for um, professional development for South Asian artists. They, they were very active in talking to the leaders of the South, South Asian community and had the buy-in of the community and through that the communications could happen. But it is working very hard to um, discover those new communication um, channels in order to reach those, those groups. That's a great question. Is, um, uh, I know that, uh, for example, at the Tet there is a space that is uh, commercially available to art, established artists that uh, that rent the space and, and put on uh, their expositions uh, of their work. Uh, and that's great that we have that space that, available. Is there anyone in the cultural, I guess in this, in this group, that's monitoring those, uh, those exhibitions and approaching those artists and um, through them getting outreach to the emerging artists that they may know? we have a very broad community and so we would have to it's not just them there's a lot of people that we could reach but we would um, need to to work with them but um, there's the traditional means but there's the non-traditional means and that's why we had such a diverse community that was actually giving us ideas for the access to individual communities uh, yeah I, I, I guess please make a comment but I, I, I think we do need for, for it to be successful, we need to have effective contact with yeah. the actual artists. I, absolutely. And that's why in our research, we actually went out to the community, to as many artists as we could, and we all had very diverse networks to get them to fill out that survey so that we were hearing from different kinds of artists, but it was that direct contact with the artists. Sorry, Councillor Hill. Uh, and through you... Mr. Chair, just uh, I, I, I may have missed it in here, but I didn't see any references to sort of the professional uh, art educators like in the school boards and maybe at St. Lawrence College, what their connection to this would be. I mean, I, I sort of would think that uh, if we're looking to really promote the arts among our own youth and bring them up through into professional uh, and, and ability to show into the community, that that connection is pretty critical. So I yeah. don't, uh, and I'm sure That's you have a great that. addition to have because uh, we have arts educators um, that were involved with that, but um, not at the school board level. And that is the great next step to, to partner with um, the, the public and um, separate school board to ensure that arts educators are, are part of this. Councillor Sanic. Through you, Mr. Chair, we have um, an added tonight. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's from Heart Center. Yes. And they're asking for us to um, insert some wording about 
um, mixed abilities under the inclusion um, workshop and classes, right? And so yeah. just adding some wording about yes. mixed abilities. Um, did the working group discuss this or did this happen after the working group came up with their proposal? Like if we were to add that, would the working group, um, how yes. would they feel? The working group would accept that. As we did talk about it, that we didn't ar articulate it as well as we could, but we did talk about that. So thank you. And, and Catherine Porter is doing excellent work and it would be a privilege to partner with her. She's, she's fabulous, so she's doing great work. With, that's a great addition, thank you. Anyone else on the co committee? Could I ask a process question? Sure, go ahead. Um, we've submitted um, a report and some great amendments were suggested tonight. Do, do we go back to the committee and get the amendments done and resubmit? What, what would be the process? I think I'll ask the Director of Cultural Services the best way to deal with this. My inclination is yes, but uh, because I wouldn't want to just do this. I think it would be better if I went away and got in, integrated properly. So. I, but whatever you want. In answer to and I'll defer to the, the committee clerk as well. Uh, our understanding is that the work of the working group was completed and so at the last arts advisory uh, committee under the terms of reference that were approved by council, that committee has now been, or that working group has now been dissolved. So I'll defer to the um, committee clerk to answer how the amendments get uh, integrated into the document that's been presented. So, uh, Thank you, Colin. It'd be a simple matter of if any amendments were approved at the committee tonight, they would simply be added into the document, <coughs> excuse me, as it is forwarded to council because the committee does have the ability to add those items in it. Okay. So we'll, we'll do those amendments and send it back to you? Oh, got it. No, no, that, that will be to happen here tonight if the committee decides to do it. Okay. It's. That's wonderful, thanks, I just want to know the process. Thanks everybody for your time. Okay, so there are no question, public questions at briefings. So we'll um, move on to the next item. That is uh, seven business, part A, the implications associated with establishing a legal wall adjacent to Douglas Fir Park. We had um, a description of the um, report. Are there any other staff comments? No? Okay. Uh, any um, comments or questions from the committee? Um, should I read it now? Yeah, before that. Well, we've got to go here first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody from the committee got any questions regarding the art on the wall? Okay. And the um, graffiti. Seeing none, now we'll go to comments from the public, if they've got any. Yes, certainly. Um, please give your name and um, address and the whole schmeal, please. So Not that I don't know, but... I know, but I always forget. <laughs> so my name is Mary Farrar, and I live at One Plus Darm Unit 83 in Kingston. And uh, thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm totally thrilled about the motion to make the art wall a legal wall. I mean, to be truthful, I'm involved in so many projects, and I'm totally thrilled to see something that might actually happen before I die. <laughs> you know? Thanks to Colin Wigginton and his steady hand, and uh, Danica for putting together a really good report that looks at, um, globally, um, the uh, importance and the vibrancy of street art everywhere and how it is a truly acceptable art form these days. Because Rob, um, Councillor Hutchison, will remember back in the dark days of 2014, when um, we first came with our proposal to waive the graffiti bylaw for a week in order to allow a juried art, uh, street art competition based on the specifications of the mural festival in Montreal, which takes two 
kilometers of Saint Laurent Boulevard every year and brings in thousands of millions of tourists. I mean, it's a huge, huge event. And thankfully, I know Rob was really nervous about, um, about the presentation and whether it would pass council because the downtown BIA was totally against graffiti, street art, believing that it would just encourage more tagging on the walls of downtown businesses and they didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, however, the PowerPoint was successful and it was accepted unanimously by council and it was a totally wonderful event in 2014. And I especially was brought to tears by a young man, a young student of Karen Peppercorns here uh, at QE in the art program because he was an extremely talented young man, 18 years old, and he had in fact paid $850 to the city in fines for painting his really beautiful art, um, you know, in various places around the city. And, you know, this was a dream of his, not only his, but of many other uh, street artists in the city to actually be able for an entire week without looking over their shoulder to see if the police were there, to actually have the time to spend to really uh, improve the quality of their artwork. So it was a really a wonderful, wonderful thing for them. And I did make a specific point of reaching out to artists of all different um, disciplines, you know, from the Heart Studios um, to David Dossett, who's a very traditional artist, and everything in between. And uh, in the 2017 iteration of the festival, again, you know, many different art styles from um, all over the place. And I think it compares globally, frankly. And I can see it um, being a major tourist attraction in the days when the Deepwater Port comes and, you know, tourists are there and it's so close to the downtown. And we see tourists all the time. And I'm, you know, after the news item, thank you, Global News, um, a couple of days ago, several people came up to me and said, oh, you know, you're the one who did the wall. It's so great, I so enjoy it. I just love going down to, to the park. And so, you know, follow-up um, has been quite interesting because, um, well, I first of all, uh, Brian Melody thought, well, I'll do one on my wall. And he had a, a chain link fence in the West End and he actually put up, um, you know, plywood uh, squares and, got artists who had been a part of the On the Wall to come and, and do it on his property. And that was a fun thing. And I did get um, asked by residents in Kingston Mills if the retaining wall at the uh, locks could also be um, to have street art. And um, that has you know, fallen through a little bit, but we haven't forgotten about it. It was a little complicated, as all these things can be, because Parks Canada is involved, and they had to be notified. But the actual owners of the retaining wall are, are an engineering company in Ottawa, and they want to have the wall done, because it will save them from having to paint over tagging. So in due course, um, we'll figure out a way to get that done, too. And the Spearhead uh, Brewery, um, asked to have um, one of the street artists decorate their wall. And, um, and I recently got a phone call from a resident in um, Reddendale, and he has hired one of the street artists to do a picture of, um, oh, what is that beautiful, beautiful um, statue in France commemorating the war? I'm a blank, but everybody knows what I mean. They're really meaningful. So he's going to do something there, hired. So, you know, it's wonderful that it's leading to commercial, um, you know, gain by these artists. So I'm really quite thrilled about that. Um, so I guess um, initially um, we, um, we had to waive the graffiti bylaw. And again, in 2017, we had to waive the graffiti bylaw for a week. Ms. Farrar, you want me to 30 stop? 30 seconds. I'll stop, okay. <laughs> well, I guess I've said enough. Um, so I hope that there is a future in Kingston for other examples of street art as well. And this is just an awesome start to a whole new uh, fun vibe in Kingston. Thanks. Thank you, Anyone Anybody else? have any questions? Yes, well, okay. you, don't you don't get questions. 
if you if the staff has a comment, then <laughs> oh, okay, that's what you'll get. That's that's the process. Okay, so, I'm done. Okay, I I think they probably have uh, heard your position many times. <laughs> the uh, so um, anyone else from the um, from the public? I want to correct myself in, in part. You get five minutes. You I don't can need five have. Minutes. You can use your five Thank minutes. You. My name's pretty Karen. much as you please. So you have comments <laughs> and or questions. Thanks to Mary for doing an incredible briefing of this. Um, my name is Karen Peppercorn. I live at two seventy eight Wellington Street, and I'm also the founder of the Creative Arts Focus Program of the Limestone District School Board, established in nineteen ninety. And with great honor, I received the Arts Champion Award from the mayor uh, this last November. Um, I'm just speaking to the importance of the graffiti wall. When, the, when it started, Mary invited me to be one of the jurors. And Harley Brushy was one of my students. And yes, he paid all those fines. Um, I think the most important thing to say about all of this is that Kingston is, and if you listen to CBC today, uh, who is Bruce, Bruce Kaufman from the Poets Circle of the World and the Writers, there's a huge event at the Tet tomorrow for that. Because, and, and, and CBC has been putting all day, like the last week, how amazing Kingston's arts community is in every aspect. And I think that this aspect of us in allowing a space for people who feel the, the passion to create murals in public spaces uh, is really, really important. Um, so Harley had his chance and he did a beautiful mural uh, way back when this started. And since then, there have been many more beautiful things created. It's created a community in Doug Fleur Park. Uh, Kingston is a, on the map. I mean, look at the musicians who came from Kingston, who are world famous. Every aspect of our community is rooted in the arts, uh, mandatorily and, and importantly. Um, and it's, it's really important to look at, like look at Rick Mercer and Graffiti Alley in Toronto. We will never have Graffiti Alley, which is an immense place. I've been there a couple times and it's mind boggling. But it is an opportunity for people who are on, on the fringe of art, uh, to express themselves. It's really important, as Danica mentioned, to note that there is a code in graffiti art. And there is a code for if someone does something magnificent and someone else goes over it, they're in big trouble with the rest of the graffiti community. Uh, in our case, we have uh, a legislative guided body of people that are gonna monitor that. But there is a very uh, code of honor in the graffiti community. But not all artists who want to express themselves do it on paper in traditional ways in art galleries, um, especially young people, especially young people. And I've been teaching for 37 years in, in the limestone board, and I can tell you uh, there's so many incredible, brilliant lights in that place. Uh, in, in all education, in all, in all young people, but they need a place to express themselves. And sometimes it's not traditionally. So this gives that a voice. And it also gives a really vibrant um, outlet for people coming down the street, for people going into Doug Fleur Park. And as you know, Doug Fleur Park has been uh, rejuvenated significantly. Um, and that's a really important thing. So I think... The most, the most vital part of this conversation is to say that um, this is a step forward for Kingston to become the part of a greater world community. Um, yes, not all of us like all forms of art or any form of the arts, right? We all have our, our favorite thing. and it, it may not be the arts, it may be sports, it may be music, it may be computers, it may be industrial design, it may be crossword puzzles, I don't know. But the point is, everybody has a passion, and, and Kingston has the capacity as an arts community, as a STEAM community, to embrace all of it. And we are on the edge. We are on the leading edge of so much stuff that a lot of other places in Ontario aren't. 
and a lot of other places in Canada aren't. And I think this is a really great move forward. Danica, thank you to um, put ourselves out there and give ourselves a chance to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, we have a of course. Okay. Your name and address, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Frank Dixon, 495 Alfred, Department 2, K7K4, J4. And just a note to the clerk, I've written this out and I'll give this to you to save taking any notes. So. Okay, so um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, city staff and citizens and media. So I completely support this creation of a legal wall pilot project adjacent to Douglas Fir Park. I very much enjoy the public art presented in this space in past years. This is a new creation for Kingston with some exceptional art. I'm requesting that more information be provided to the ARC Council, the public, and media concerning the physical dimensions and properties of the wall, including the length, height, and number of panels available. And as well, I would advocate for the permanent preservation of all public art to be created and presented in this space for the city's archives through professional photography, perhaps at a potential future municipal art gallery. A very interesting example for your notice, the small town of Chimenez, BC, which is on Vancouver Island, came up with an overall concept for public art for the town, embracing an historic portrayal of key events. As well, I would very much like to see some restoration of the former Hanson Garage historical mural series, which were removed a few years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Staff, any response to these three? Um, three, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, certainly we're happy as part of the communication strategy around this initiative to make uh, more definitive information available, as Mr. Dixon has requested. Uh, something that I do want to flag that's articulated in the report, uh, just so people are clear that. Uh, Street art projects like this, legal walls, are what are referred to as self-regulated. So currently, uh, there are a number of pieces that were created that are still uh, existing on the wall from that 2017 celebration of the arts organized by the Friends of the Kingston Inner Harbor. What we anticipate, though, with the legal wall is that it will actually become, a, a hopefully, a lively, organic, and transforming, changing space. And so the murals that are there right now may eventually be painted over by other artists who take the opportunity to use that platform. So a uh, part of our strategy is to be documenting the wall through this pilot project. Uh, we'll take into advisement the suggestion of trying to document what's there for a historical record. Uh, but part of the dynamic of what we're trying to create is that the wall itself will constantly be evolving and some of the murals that uh, are known right now uh, may eventually be replaced by other pieces uh, by artists who come along afterwards and that that's part of this uh, sort of living dynamic of this kind of work. So that'll also be part of our communication strategies to make people understand the fact that it's not meant to be a static representation of a set number of images, but that it will be constantly evolving. Thank you. Um, back to the committee, any other questions from the committee? I've got a couple. Um, <clears throat> maybe I missed this, <laughs> okay. I read it, but I'm, maybe I missed this. A um, couple things. Will art on the wall be repeated or will we just go to the organic version come July? I'm not sure of the Friends of the Kingston Inner Harbor planning another iteration of On the Wall at this time. Uh, that was something that was initiated by the community through their own efforts. Uh, my understanding under this pilot project is that it will be organic in the process as it moves forward. And um, that you can't adulterate, the code says you can't adulterate uh, a piece of uh, graffiti or street art. Um, how it would be decided when a image has uh, served its purpose or had its time? 
How will the, the organics work, in other words? <laughs> uh, to answer your question, Mr. Chair, the criteria that we as staff will be using to assess the wall actually has more to do with uh, illegal activity. So the pieces that were there will be left as they are, and we will only be intervening at such time as uh, there might be uh, the appearance of tagging or inappropriate language, hate, uh, anything that incites uh, you know, improper behavior. So really the it's up to the community to monitor and evolve the wall as it wants to. Our role will to be make sure that it doesn't uh, veer off in a direction that would be controversial or problematic. So the community could elect to white out an image in the hopes that someone else will replace it with something else. So that is possible. Suggesting, I'm just trying to figure out how this is supposed to work. And they come to call and find out how to do that. They do that, do they? No, they do not. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. So we'll see what happens. Thank you. The, um, okay, so we have the recommendation, which I have to read as chair, and that is that the Arts Recreation Community Policies Committee recommend that council grant an exemption to section 4.17 of property standards bylaw number 2005-100 in relation to the retaining wall on the Rio Crest property located adjacent to Douglas Fleur Park to allow staff to establish and manage a legal wall that features street art as a pilot project for 10 months between July 1, 2019 and April 30, 2020, and that council directs staff to report back in Q2 2020 regarding the results of the legal wall pilot project, as well as future plans related to the potential development of an integrated street art plan as an appendix to the public art master plan and the development of graffiti management strategy as a companion piece. Does anyone on the co committee have a comment? Councillor Stroud. Brief comment and then actually it's gonna to lead to another question. Um, I saw in, again, in, in BC, and I guess uh, Mr. Dixon's comments remind me of this, a community that had uh, street art in the form of wooden sculptures, and that was their thing in this particular town. I can't remember the name of the town at this point, but it was on Vancouver Island as well. Anyway, it, and it, it was organic. It, it, it resembled a lot of, of what we're hearing in the description, uh, and it recurred. Um, in the summertime, no specific time, and some of the sculptures had been there for years and some were new, and, but there was a limited amount of space. It wasn't a very big town. It might have been Campbell River, actually. Anyway, um, and I, w I remember thinking at the time, okay, so is this, is this the, what's, what's the municipality doing about this? Is this, uh, did they start this? Is it sanctioned? How do you get a sculpture here? When what does one get removed? What happens if they run out of space? So I guess the question would be, what if uh, in this organic process, other forms of art that aren't painted right on the wall appear in the vicinity of the park, such as uh, wooden sculptures or things like that? Uh, how would that impact the pilot project? To you, Mr. Chair, that's a think under the the situation that we're currently in, that would be deemed unsanctioned and would likely be removed. I guess I'll comment that you don't know where this might end up uh, with artistic, uh, with creative minds, and uh, I I think that uh, in general, if we're if we're opening it up, uh, it's tied to the idea of tagging, un unwanted tagging as a form of expression, which is contrary, is illegal. Uh, this is legal, this is in contrast, a legal place to create art. Uh, and there, it will be interacting with tagging and graffiti. Uh, and, and then there's the question of other things it may be interacting with that aren't part of the policy. So I'm interested to see how this works out and uh, what street artists make of all this. I think it'll be a very uh, fascinating process. I know that so far it's been successful and I hope that it continues to be so. I will support the policy, thank you. Fair enough, anyone else? 
I have to say that we are entering a period of history where doing uh, legally that which was illegal before is happening in a number of places. <laughs> you know, from uh, retaining walls to head shops. So we'll just have to see how it all works out. <laughs> stay around, stay tuned. Um, I just want to say that it's been a journey. Uh, I have to admit that at some point, uh, Mary Farrar dragged me down the pathway of innovation and, and possibly the city in general. And, um, but uh, it's been a real success. You know, you can take people down there and show them these things. Now, and uh, they're, it's, it's, it's thrilling and interesting and exciting and, uh, and uh, difficult because, I mean, tagging has gone on. There are political opinions being <laughs> stated there and, uh, and uh, historical interpretation and um, also illegal things becoming legal. The, um, <laughs> so um, I think it's exciting and that's kind of the atmosphere in a way that we want to, you know, no one's getting hurt here. There's no real negative side that we've seen. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of atmosphere we want to create in Kingston is that is creative and you can go to the edge. You can't hurt people, but you can, uh, you can find your métier to, to express yourself and, and do new things, whether it be technological or artistic or, or what have you. So I think this is... I talked to the uh, those those two people over there, um, the staff about this and the, and how we want to do have that kind of atmosphere because it creates innovation in all ways. It's all interbreeding, and I don't speak. It's a way to speak. So, so I I'm very happy to um, support this. I hope the, and I'm pretty sure the committee will, but I hope they will and um, take it to council, and, and then we're just um, go do something that doesn't happen in city government too much. It's not all nailed down. We're actually gonna see what happens, and then we're gonna have to be nimble, and uh, that will be fun if we take the right attitude. <laughs> you know, there might, some things might happen that uh, we're not expecting, but uh, you know, that happens every day when you go out the door, and sometimes before you get out the door. So I'm not worried about that. In answer to, in part, with the, the concern that Councillor Hill brought up, which was quite a legitimate concern, uh, buildings down there or houses or garages or out buildings have been tagged in the past, but before this happened, before the, the wall, Okay, was the art on the wall. And I don't know if so much staff has heard about since, but it's uh, certainly, de it's definitely not worse than it was before, definitely, from counselor's point of view. Uh, but uh, things did happen on occasion that, you know, and then the marking up the postal boxes and all that sort of stuff, which happens all over the city, which is, you know, regrettable and not particularly constructive, you know, and that sort of thing, where it's just a private and a public cost. That, hopefully, this will siphon off some of that, and um, and that will be a, a positive byproduct of of the program that we're developing, which will be, I think, positive and creative. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Anything, for anybody else? We have a repost to that, maybe. <laughs> So all those in favor? We need a mover oh, and a mover and seconder. That's right. We never got there. Councillor Stroud and Councillor Sanek. All those in favor? There. It's passed. Thank you. Seven um, B is a report received from the Housing and Homelessness Advisor Committee. Um, Mr. Labeman is probably here for this, unless he's passing for something else tonight. No. <laughs> So if you could uh, give us an introduction, we would appreciate that, please. 
through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so we have a in the Housing and Social Services Department a number of years ago developed a program at the onset of when the bylaws were changed to allow secondary suites in much of the of the city. Um, at the same time, we implemented a program by which we would incentivize persons to convert their houses to secondary suites as long as they agreed to keep their properties uh, affordable for a certain time period. And there's a couple of those programs. One is to offset the cost of the planning applications that might still be needed if you're not in an area of the city where they're allowed by right. And then secondarily, uh, we would offset the cost of the construction of the unit themselves and the conversion, again, if they uh, agreed to keep the units affordable for a time period. While the secondary suites program has been very successful and 160 units of those have been created since the bylaw was changed, uh, we've only seen a small uptake in this in the actual program itself for the for the incentive. So what's in front of the committee and one of the major issues at the time, I'll, I'll be honest about that, was that it was restricted to persons who lived on the property. So in order to gain access to this funding, you must actually be the homeowner yourself and continue to live there. So essentially just converting the basement or something to a, a second unit apartment. Uh, staff are proposing to try, that's been one of the major barriers uh, to people uh, seeking out this funding. So staff are, had recommended to the Housing and Homelessness Committee that it be opened up to any landowner, property owner, to be able to take advantage of this funding in order to create secondary units in their buildings. And uh, that's what's in front of the committee and was approved by the Housing and Homelessness Committee. Thank you very much. The um, down the committee, Does there, are there any questions to staff on this proposal? Councillor Stroud. Could, they, could this be used then by a landowner that's a rental, uh, rental landlord to legitimize units already functioning, already being rented on the open market, but perhaps not in compliance with all the, build, the building code and the, and the, you know, the various things? So, I mean, they're, they're, we all know that these uh, units exist. Could this be used to legitimize some of these uh, units by these rental landlords? Through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, certainly. If there was eligible costs in order to do so, and they committed to renting to a, to a person who meets the income guidelines, uh, then definitely. Uh, you do have, it is up to $15,000 or 75% of development costs. So if there was very few costs associated with that legalization, it may not be beneficial for somebody. But certainly if they had to fire rate the, the, the unit and those kind of added, added accessible w windows and access points, someone would be eligible for that. So is that, is that part of the rationale then of opening up to non-owner non occupied buildings because, of, because we know that these, these non-conforming secondary units are already extant and we're, and we're hoping that folks will, will you know, make use of, this, of these monies to, to decrease the number of illegal units? Through you, Mr. Chair. I, actually, I don't believe we actually have had considered that in to great extent. The reason for presenting it to the Housing and Homelessness Committee was anecdotally, uh, our staff, when people were coming to the building department to create new units, wanted to access this program, but were restricted by the home ownership. So it was new units, and that's what the information that was coming back from us. Uh, I think there was a fear when we initial when secondary suites were initially expanded throughout the city by right that neighborhoods may be inundated with inappropriate development and that restricting it to homeowners was a means by which um, we couldn't restrict through the zoning bylaw that it had to be a homeowner who was converting i uh, had to live there but that at the time, the housing committee felt that this was a was a necessary restriction because it was an unknown, you know, as to what the implications would be, and uh, I don't believe now that we're five years into that that um, 
that concern is not as great, I don't believe. Well, thank you. Um, Councillor Hill. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. The, uh, would students be able to access this housing? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, certainly if they meet the income guideline, which presumably many students would, uh, we don't have any, uh, we had considered that at the time and did not find a reasonable way or, or actual justification to, uh, to actually restrict that. So yes, they would be eligible if they met the, the income requirements, which presumably most would. So I guess, Mr. Chair, my, 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 maybe uh, uh, you could uh, uh, qualify this for me, but I, I, I would assume that part of the reason that uh, uh, it was restricted to homeowners was because we wanted to build housing, affordable housing for the current residents of Kingston. What I'm a bit concerned about is that this could be sort of used to create a situation where we're in effect subsidizing current landowners to build additional units for student housing, which is not, I think, what this is intended to do. Are you looking for a response from, yes, well, so through me to Mr. Lehman then? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure I could comment on the, on the extent of the original thinking uh, it was certainly, yeah, the unknown of who would rent these and trying to preserve neighborhoods was part of the discussion, certainly. And uh, I certainly remember at the time, the discussion was certainly revolved around more suburban neighborhoods, you know, and that maybe an entire street could be taken over or something like that. Um, I'm not sure that it was done in, this, in the context of the students, but um, certainly I think you know, there could be one, one uh, any units that are created, of course, are helpful for, for, the, for the demand side of, and the supply side of, of, uh, of, the, of the affordable housing issue. So if any units that could be incentivized for $15,000 is uh, when we're often funding $150,000, $200,000 for a new affordable unit, if there's a means by which we can create a unit for 15,000, it was seen as an affordable way to try to incentivize a, a, a potentially affordable unit. One last question then, thank you. Uh, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, is uh, are we, would we be able to uh, um, make this specific to certain areas in the city so that, for example, we, we maybe not want to include the university district in these kinds of secondary, in this kind of subsidy for secondary units? And I, I guess the idea being, that we, you know, we're trying to uh, to encourage affordable housing throughout the, the the district, and my feeling would be that the people that would tend to take this up would be concentrated in the university district. Mr. Lehman, I'm not aware of a reason why you wouldn't be able, why council could not restrict that um, geographically in the bylaw. Uh, we've given no consideration to that at this point, though, as to what how we might recommend or, or be able to draw such a map, but I don't, I'm not aware of a reason you couldn't. Can, perhaps I could um, not, clear, not clear it up, <laughs> but uh, you saw from Councillor Stroud's remarks there, we're very concerned about illegal units, being fire traps, for instance, or not making, uh, not being very good living conditions for students or whoever is living there. There's a lot of concern over the years about basements being used. We now allow that under a certain definition of what a basement is. And uh, so I don't, you'd have to talk to, to, to both of us, I guess, about uh, Councillor Stroud in particular, about what the implications of not doing this and expanding the areas where we're going to allow this. Uh, the, the big dig, and I think uh, up and down Division Street has released a lot of area, which was not available for secondary suites. You can correct me if you want, Mr. Lehman, because I remember originally years back, we couldn't do it, even though 
my area, for instance, my district is riddled with with illegal units, and uh, but we just pretended we didn't see them because we didn't think we had the capacity to legally to accommodate them. Capacity, I mean, water, sewer, that sort of electric. So now, when I looked at the map, they showed us that budget. I think, oh, I perked up. I said, oh wait, now it's cleared. So this is part, probably Mr. Lehman and his group have looked at that. It, is that accurate? And that it now can do it in the, uh, hmm, I don't know, Stephen area of uh, Kingstown, and up by Reggie. And uh, so anyway, these are considerations. Um, I think should be in the pot and be swirled around. That's all I'm really saying. So Ajay, he wants to respond, and then I'll come back to you. Uh, Chair, uh, certainly, yeah, the, the planning department has done significant work to expand the, the, the secondary suite areas by right, and will I believe the bylaw was in, has been or will be in front of the planning committee shortly to expand it even further. I, I would just be concerned, uh, just from a po policy perspective, though, that if it's been determined that secondary suites are permitted and appropriate throughout various areas of the, of the city through the zoning bylaw, the planning process, I'm not sure what the linkage would be to be able to then further restrict this program if council has determined that it's an appropriate uh, thing to approve throughout the city in various areas, and then we have a, pro a program that's mirroring that, that um, that same bylaw, and that we're going to further restrict it on a geographic district basis. That would that's that would seem to be somewhat concerning. Councillor Hill, I, I I certainly hear what uh, Mr. Laylaw is saying, but I, I I don't think council would have contemplated the notion that what they what this was going to lead to was the subsidizing landlords to build. Uh, secondary units so I, I would I guess that my feeling was I'd like to make a motion to defer this to, to ask uh, st uh, staff to come back and uh, give us a, a, a more information about that specific component of it and whether or not we can uh, make recommendations to um, make this specific to certain areas in the city Uh, and you know what? You can. We. I'm gonna, I, this is what I, I'm yeah, going to do. Yeah. I'm going to go to Councillor Sanic and ask questions, and I'll go around again. Yeah. You're not like it's not yeah, like a yeah, council. Fine. You get yeah. one shot, okay? And that's why I yeah. let, we did it the way I did because we had a constructive discussion going on, and I th always think that's useful. So we'll just go to Councillor Sanic. Maybe you know we never know what the next question will reveal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I definitely have concerns that this could open things up for abuse. And um, so I just have two questions. Um, if we did approve this, can we make it just for one year only to see what the uptake would be and then have this brought back to council in one year to decide if we want to then stop the program or if we want to continue it? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I don't see why not. We have plenty of programs that are pilot in nature and have sunset clauses or required to come back to council to report back on the on the status and the success or the or the challenges that we face. So, again, I think that's possible. That's certainly possible and not out of the norm of other programs that we have. Thank you. And my second question is for the other cities that have universities that are comparators, like maybe Guelph, um, London, um, Peterborough, what? Waterloo, um, do they also offer this program? And is it open to um, all area, like to everybody? Or sorry, our, the big thing, the change is if it's um, owner occupied. Mm -hmm. And um, for the other cities that have universities, do they have that restriction to be owner occupied, do you know, or is it open? to even those homes that are not owner-occupied. I'm not familiar with the answer to that question. I'm not sure if those cities have similar programs or not. I'd have to come back to with that information. 
Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Chair, if we do a second round and then end up deferring it, um, that would be an additional piece of information that would be helpful to see what the outcome's been in other cities if they're not owner occupied. And just to add on, like if um, Councillor Chappelle was here tonight on this committee, I know his thing at planning committee has been owner occupied. Can we get residential units, you know, built? but the stipulation that they have to be owner occupied. And the answer has been no due to um, zoning restrictions, you know, and inclusion. Um, and so to actually, for this, we have the ability to make it owner occupied to then give it up. I know that probably Councillor Chappelle would have problems with that. So we're not the only ones that see these concerns. Yeah, I think that's good. Councillor Straub, I mean, it was good to add that. Just wanted to have another round um, before we start talking about deferral uh, uh, details to just get, to shed some more light on on what we're discussing here. So, how this the reason just to sort of encapsulate what everyone's been saying the reason that the the, the distinction is actually quite significant between an owner occupied secondary suite and a secondary suite that from a legal standpoint is, I mean, it's the building that has a secondary suite, it's not the owner, but it's, uh, if it's owner occupied, you can understand what secondary suite, granny suite, in-law suite, everybody knows what that means. It always had an owner occupied element in its sort of, uh, the way people understand it, uh, understand such a thing as a secondary suite. However, um, from what Councilor Osanik was saying, uh, uh, legally and in the Planning Act, there is no way in, in, in that framework to describe uh, because you can't discriminate amongst tenants and owners or any uh, stuff like that. However, what we have in a district like mine or Councillor Hutchison is, first of all, the housing stock is predominantly uh, tenant occupied uh, by the numbers, but, but the owners uh, may, all, may well want secondary suite capability and may want this incentive, but for some reason there was no uptake on the program when it was first uh, introduced, which was what we really wanted. And I, and I say, and I think that to, to change it around and to say, well, we'll just open it right up uh, for anyone because we want to get more units built, it will end up, the thing that's driving housing in Kingston is the, the rental market because of the shortage, right? So that's what's, that's what's gonna use this. Uh, and, and you know the percentage of owner occupied uh, conversions will be very low. Um, so yes, I think we need a, a pilot aspect and I think we need more information as well. And there's an, another piece uh, uh, reason for deferral. So uh, just to cast your minds back to the problem with monster rental home additions uh, in my district for student housing specifically. So, you know, six bedroom houses going to 12 or seven bedroom houses going to 15 with just a, you know, a very large addition added into the backyard. That was the reason for large uh, discussion in the interim control bylaw that I proposed and your department argued successfully and convinced council to not go that route uh, partly because of some other measures that were being put in place to regulate housing built form, uh, such as the secondary plan uh, North Kingstown, and such as the essential infill growth strategy, which was started at that time. Both of those are ongoing and, and coming back soon. So those timelines, it just, it, I it really don't see the rationale for making this change in the period that we've deferred other things until the end of those secondary plans. Uh, the zoning bylaw update as well uh, needs to be done. It's been deferred until the end of those secondary plans. Uh, that's the whole central area of the city. Um, I think this, this change that will be taken up by rental landlords because they can, and if there's any money to be made, they will use it, and then we end up subsidizing for-profit business uh, in the name of creating more housing, and that's not necessarily what council's gonna wanna do. So. Uh, I will support a deferral if someone wants to come up, and 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 I would add that um, until after the secondary plans, as we've deferred other things for uh, with those timelines, and I can speak to time and place when that comes up. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to just put it in a hopper here to be considered, and that is um, 
It's essentially Council Stroud's point and to some extent Councilor Hill's point, and I'm just trying to collapse it in terms of, like, it seems to me that what staff is doing here is they want to encourage more rental supply, unit supply. And, and, and that's laudable, that's good. Um, however, um, if we had 161 permits and only eight of them came from homeowners, homeowners, and I'll interject here that the main reason why people don't do this is the cost. It's like, what, 40 to 60,000 to do this? It's, it's sizable, okay? I, I, I'm sure I, I, that's like a number. I was shocked when I saw the number, okay? To do all the things that you need to do to make it safe, uh, um, conforming build, right? So to me, one of the ways of uh, encapsulating this might be that if the ratio is 161 to 8, or maybe it's 153 to 8, how does that this proposal change that ratio? In other words, if people are going to build secondary units and they're not in the, the house, then are they just not going to do it anyway because uh, the market says this is a smart thing to do? So that's my question. And like, I mean, we're digging around for your rationality and all that, because you can see people think there's a bit of a problem there. And if it's like this here, and this may be, uh, you can imagine what it's going to be like at council, okay? Sure. So. so I think just to clarify, of the 161 secondary units, it doesn't mean that only eight of them have been done by homeowners. Only eight of them have taken advantage of the funding. So we don't have data to know what the percentage of people who actually are owner occupied that have got the 161 permits. So that's that's the one thing. Uh, the I'm just well. I think there's two things that that we're concerned about. We have a program by which we can incentivize secondary suites that's been very low take up, you know, and, and not successful. And we just and we are analyzing why it's not successful. We've been to community groups. We've been to, you know, real estate agent groups. We've done, you know, all those kind of things. And and the barrier has been what we're told and what we've determined is the owner occupied element of it. That's I understand the, the hesitation behind that for sure. But I also want to show that there are numerous examples of of things that that we've brought to council as, a, as the housing department and council has approved to incentivize private development at a much higher rate per unit than this. That it's not, we've, we've had numerous affordable housing projects that we've brought to council in the hundreds of thousands of dollars per unit to private landlords and that have, and that have to try to get apartment buildings approved. This is taking a similar approach, but only restricting it to $15,000 at the maximum or 7,000, depending on which, which program it is. So the concern that we're gonna incentivize pri the developers or landlords instead of homeowners, we, we certainly have a track record of doing that. And the 10-year housing plan actually encourages that, that we should be seeking out private development opportunities not just nonprofits or other opportunities, but that that's an area that should be sought out to increase the supply of housing and the, increase the supply of affordable housing. Um, certainly the pilot project, or we can bring back additional information. I just wanted to clarify that um, just, to, just to make sure that we're comparing the right issues, you know, here with that, that there's been a number of projects in the hundreds of thousands of dollars per unit that we've done for private developers um, in apartment style buildings as a comparator. Thank you, that, that's an interesting, good point. That's why I laughed, okay, not, <laughs> I just thought, oh yeah, good point. Um, so just to, sort of flesh out some of this, and before I go to Councillor Hill again, um, how, much, how, much was, how much money was allocated to this 
program um, in the in the last bef before you brought it here? Like, how much money has been was in the budget, and and how much in the last year did we spend? Mm -hmm. uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So uh, we have not developed a specific budget for this that would appear in a municipal budget. Uh, council has adopted the $1 million towards affordable housing that we use to incentivize uh, developers to build affordable housing. This is just taken from that, that $1 million capital program. Uh, so what, if we have given out eight, I don't know the specific amount, but I'm, I would assume that the average is the max at 15,000. So I'm sure we're in the 100 to 150,000 total over this time period. So would it be fair to say that, um, that this money in the budget competes with money that could possibly go to the development of nonprofit housing? That's correct. It would. Okay. It's from the same uh, allocated uh, uh, sure. budget item. So there's a program competition we, there. We have. I should be clarify. Like internally, we've devoted. We we keep this program in mind when we're determining how much money to provide to nonprofits or something for the normal kind of apartment style capital incentives. Sure. Sure. I'm just thinking that it costs a lot of money to get a project going, and. Even $100,000 would not do it, but yeah. it's something, okay? I just wanted to make sure I knew what was going on there. Yeah. The, um, my other question, what was it? Um, so my next question, I guess, can't be answered because it was, how do we handle the take up on the program if we did do this proposal? The take up presumably would be higher and um, but if we don't have a specific number, we wouldn't know when the funding was exhausted. That's correct. We, we've, we would not be able to go over budget, certainly. Uh, each year, we kind of allocate for our own planning $100,000 mm -hmm. just to ensure that we don't run into that issue. It's never been an issue, clearly, because of the numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have other programs, though, that I don't believe we would need council approval to restrict that usage. It would just be an internal staff decision sure. as to how to balance another secondary or something else that we want that we fund and present to council. You know, as a, promos a proposal, and I'm not making, just trying to flesh things out. Um, what if we were to have a ratio that if it's owner occupied, we'll give you X or the loan Y, right? And then if it's not owned by the owner, we'll give you half of each of those. Since the it does seem from the numbers such as we've got them, that people are doing it anyway if it's not owner occupied. So like, there must be a rationale behind these numbers yeah. uh, because you must have calculated, well, we can move the market at 7,000, but we can't move it at four. Right. Through you, Mr. Chair, I don't. I would know the answer to that, but I would. My one cautionary comment on that would be that the goal of the of the program is to create an affordable unit that will have an affordable person who's making a certain amount of money or less to live in that unit, and I would be hard pressed to understand what the difference would be if the outcome was. A, a someone who's meeting the income requirements is living in that unit, why did we give a certain amount of money because of the ownership situation to one person versus another when the outcome was meeting the, in the intent of the plan to house someone of a, of a low income situation in that unit? Okay, I'll go back to Tom. And I do appreciate through you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, but I do appreciate you know, what, what the intent of this is. I certainly want to see more uh, of these built and, and more affordable. But I think what we're, what we're aiming here to do is to try to house uh, citizens of Kingston who are underhoused currently and support citizens of Kingston who would like to make a contribution in that regard. And I think what we might fall into is a trap where we are subsidizing 
typically landlords that don't live in the city of Kingston to build secondary units for students and that the greatest uptake is gonna be in the university district for that purpose. So I think there's just a lot of questions here that we still have. That's one of them, but I, uh, both uh, Councillor Stroud and Councillor Osanic brought up uh, excellent concerns as well. I just think it requires some more study and maybe if we could take a recess to, to form a motion or write up a motion for deferral, I would like to see us proceed in that direction. Uh, what do we, okay, then we re recess for five minutes and that seems to be the will of the committee, so. Um, I, I, what I was gonna say, I had something else I wanted to say. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the, um, apparently even reporters have to eat. But, um, so now we're back, this is the process we're gonna take. You can't defer something, something that's not on the floor. We can't put it on the floor until we hear from the public. So it's gonna go public, motion, discussion if you wish, motion to defer, okay? And um, I presume you've got a motion that says this is why and the, day, the time and place and all that sort of stuff, okay. Good, I won't waste my time on that. Uh, so uh, go to the public's comments on this. Mr. Dixon, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Five um, minutes. Thank you to the counselors and thank you to staff for the report and the answers. Uh, exceptionally informative. Um, the whole housing situation in Kingston is a special study area of mine. Um, I've been trying to learn from everybody I encounter. I'll be a big sponge on this. Um, so I've learned a lot tonight, that's, that's great. Um, so I had a couple points on this, haven't been made yet, is that one of them is the Mayor's Task Force on Housing is just getting started. So the details of the questions that have been raised so far and Mr. Laidman's answers to them, all that, that those topics would be, I think, an ideal place or an ideal uh, file or set of files to go to the Mayor's Task Force on Housing so that um, that group understands. There are a couple of councillors on it already, members of the community, uh, stakeholders, to some tenants on it now, which is great. To study all that in, in, in great detail, um, and I think my next point would be me sort of follow from that, and I, th I think maybe the, the, the city of Kingston needs to take a leadership role in documenting the entire housing realm of Kingston much more accurately than it, cr it currently sits. Um, I know there's a lot of illegal units out there. I was in one myself. I didn't know it was illegal. Um, landlord offered it for rent, um, the same as any other unit. And I learned it was illegal when it flooded and the sump didn't turn on, and that's a whole other story. But um, so when Mr. Laban was describing the fund that had been set up for this or similar sorts of endeavors, I didn't know the fund existed. And I thought independently what a great idea it would be to create such a fund to incentivize the transformation of things like, you know, uh, addicts and this sort of thing, or um, maybe addition in the right way to create the secondary suites of this type. So it already exists. Many people need to know more about it. Maybe the, the funding to it needs to be expanded since we're in a housing crisis in a, a sense in Kingston, but also it's a province-wide uh, situation and possibly national. So we're gonna solve this if we cooperate with the federal government, which apparently has an infrastructure uh, fund in place for housing supply uh, increase, and the province government as well, um, which has actually just announced the removal of rent controls in certain situations, right? So you have all these forces sort of competing dynamically um, in an area which affects everybody, right? Something like half of all Canadians are one paycheck away from being on the street. That's the current, uh, you know, media is talking about this. And that's dangerous. The amount of money that people are spending on housing compared to 20, 30, 40 years ago is a greater uh, percentage of their income. And we've got the second largest land mass in the world. And hey, we got no excuse for the problem that we've got. We gotta get at this now. So 
Thank you. Thank you. So now we come back to the committee. And um, I take it, it seems to be the will of the committee. I will now uh, read the motion. Uh, we'll can I just ask another? We need a mover and a second. Before we, we uh, yeah, we'll get it on the floor. But I have, an, I have a question before we go to, def uh, before someone moves to deferral. Fair enough. Go ahead. Oh, do you, okay. Um, usually, we read it. Yeah. Usually, it's red, and then yeah. so I'll read it, and then we'll go ahead. We're getting there. Not to worry. Not to worry. Okay. <clears throat> that the Arts, Recreation, Community Policies Committee recommend to council that the revisions to the second residential unit grant program as outlined in report number HHC 19-002 to remove the owner occupancy requirement of the program be approved. And that is it. And so do I have a mover? Councillor Stroud, the seconder, Councillor Sanic. Now, uh, Council, uh, committee, you can discuss it before you defer, right, and all that sort of stuff. So go ahead. Councillors. I'll go first because I move deferral. So, okay. so just, uh, so this is the Housing Home Homelessness uh, Advisory Committee, and it reports to the community services, or the community, the, the ARC is Arts, Rec Recreation, and Community Policies, right? Um, the question is, does this information go to any other committee such as planning before it goes to council, or is this just the route that it takes through ARC? Through you, Mr. Chair, it, this is the route that proceeds to council via ARC committee. Okay, so then I, I just, I'll just drop this out there then, because the building department, which is intimately involved with the planning committee, and the planning committee is its own um, umbrella committee, um, separate but equal to ARC that deals with built form, and this is built form, it's adding a, a new type of built form, although it, because it's for affordable housing and it's coming from the Housing and Homelessness Advisory Committee, it comes to ARC, but it intersects with all the secondary plans that are flowing in different, in, through different committees, such as planning committee. That is, I'm just pointing this out, I guess, to the clerk, that is, a procedural problem because you're getting the same subject discussed in two different streams. And uh, the only reason we know this is because we're all the same councillors, right? But the people on the Housing and Homelessness Committee that are community members aren't hearing what gets said at the discussions at North Kingstown or the discussions at, uh, with the central growth and the two different uh, groups. They don't see the reports that go to the planning committee or to council directly, right? So this, and I think you can see a little bit of the traces of that. This is a recommendation coming from staff, but where it was discussed, and I wasn't there, the Housing and Homeless Advisory Committee um, is operating in a silo, essentially, is my point. And, uh, and that's part of the reason why there's a little bit of hesitation around the table, is that uh, to have this flow through to council when it's intersecting with work of other groups and committees is, and the only, the only way to prevent it is by a, a motion here. This, that, that's the situation we're in, I'm just pointing it out. Um, and I will, that's all I've got to say for that. Anyone else to comment? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, it's, it's on the motion, so we'll wait till somebody yeah. wants to put it out. Yeah, someone has to put forward a motion to defer if that's what you wish to do. It's that simple. No, I just I think it's time to move to the deferral. Yeah. So let's, let's just ask one question of staff. I suggest that. Um, the staff feel that they have enough information to understand what this deferral is about. And when it is deferred, it doesn't just turn up at council later. It goes away and comes back to this committee. Is that correct? Mr. Leibman? Um, please, yes, if it is deferred, it will be coming back to this committee. It cannot be deferred to another committee. 
Sure. And or council. Did the movers of this pending motion, sorry, I'm getting this straightened out, um, speak to Mr. Lehman about how long it would take him to bring this back? Well, just re, uh, reviewing the deferral uh, and the conditions, I, I don't believe we would be able to, I, I think the first two, the first subsection, the clause A is the main driver of the time period. You know, so if that was, if that was the direction from the committee, I think uh, this will be deferred for some time until those rather major studies can be done that I don't believe it would be the limitation of my department to study B and C is not going to be as great as the time period needed for Clause A. Okay. Yeah. Not in the area, right? Do it right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, there's no discussion of this. Okay, so whatever <laughs> thoughts you may harbor, it <laughs> doesn't matter now because <laughs> you've got it on the floor. Right? Mr. Chair, if I just may ask for a uh, point of clarity from the mover and seconder for the clerk. So uh, the interpretation of this is that the time frame would be, the report would be deferred uh, until the completion of the two secondary studies mentioned there, the report to come back with information containing B and C. Just to clarify, that is the intent? Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, so that's going to be the chair, and that's it. So we have this in front. Are there any uh, comments regarding place and time? Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor of the motion as presented carries. My vote was solidarity, <laughs> just for the record. Okay, um, 7C, report received from Arts Advisory Committee. Um, Arts, I'm gonna read this one right off. Arts Advisory Committee reports and recommends as follows from the Arts Advisory Committee meeting held on February 14th, 2019. Uh, I, appointments to the Public Art Working Group that Arts Recreation Community Policies Committee recommends council that Alicia Buccile, Buccile, yes. And Liz shall be appointed the Public Art Working Group. So I think we should deal with these one at a time. So um, we, do I have a mover? Councillor Sandick, second by Councillor Hill. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Passes unanimously. Uh, C2, appointments to the Local Music Working Group that the Arts Recreation Community Policies Committee recommend to council that Councillor Neal, Ann Clifford, and Kirsi Hananako uh, be appointed to the local music working group. Um, a mover. There's the second clause there. Well. Oh, and I'm sorry, I missed that. And that the following members of the public be appointed to the local music working group, Virginia Clark, Chantal Prudhomme, and Greg Runyons. Um, a mover. Do I have a mover? Councillor Hill, a seconder. Councillor Stroud, uh, I have a question. What does this group do? <laughs> this group is being to support the implementation of the YGK music pilot project, <laughs> uh, which is a motion that came originally from council uh, to ask staff to look at how we could uh, create opportunities to feature local musicians on city uh, platforms like the website and uh, facilities. So it's about enacting that pilot this project. Is, this is background yes. music yes. proposal. Yes, exactly. Okay, got it. I have a question as well. Uh, is there, uh, to the clerk, why is there two for the appointments? Did that come from two separate motions at the, um, at the Arts Advisory? That. Uh, was it two separate times or was one an afterthought? I don't understand. Nope, that's it was presented. It could have been presented as one motion. I believe uh, Mr. Wigginton has more details as he was at the meeting. Uh, through you, just to clarify, the first uh, motion is related to uh, the members of the Arts Advisory Committee itself that under the terms of reference for this working group, 
there needs to be a certain number of appointments from the committee. And the second clause is members of the public being asked to, to participate in that process. Good, I think. Good. Um, so all those in favor of um, C2? Okay, that passes unanimously. Uh, C3, Professional Development Working Group Report. Um, well, this is a different thing. So, um, does staff want to speak to this, please? To you, Mr. Ch um, Trisha Baldwin, who was here this evening, also provided a briefing to the Arts Advisory Committee at its last meeting of the findings of the Professional Development Working Group and, and the context of that committee meeting they had a chance to discuss. Uh, what was brought forward and being recommended and out of that discussion the committee uh, passed this motion uh, recommending that uh, the working group report come up to the arts recreation community policy committee and asking that uh, staff take this port this report under consideration when we're doing our future priority setting so uh, they wanted to make sure that this committee understood that the arts advisory committee itself appreciated and uh, wanted to see that work endorsed in this way Thank you. Any comments or questions from the committee? Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the chair of the working group made a very thorough presentation tonight, covered a lot of ground for sure, um, but we did have the addendum added to tonight's meeting uh, from Hurt Studio. So I've proposed an amendment to add um, to that page 55 in our report. Um, <laughs> for those clauses as per, um, if we had, if Ms. Porter had sent this electronically, I would have done a, a cut and paste for all like one, two, and three, but um, it is to add to appendix one A, where it says number one, workshop and classes, and it lists all the, um, um, I don't know, the stakeholders, right, A to M, then we would be adding Heart Center as letter N, I believe, which is at the bottom, if that's where M ends, and then it goes into um, number B. So we'd be adding N, which is Heart Center. It's on page 50. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to add to, we don't want to pass a motion as mistaken. So. Right. Right. Okay. So I just ask staff if this is the place to intercede to. If, I don't know what the wording is, but to include Heart Studios is a consideration. Uh, through you, Mr. Uh, during the recess, I was speaking about this issue with the, the oh. committee clerk, and uh, we were recommending that uh, the communique that was received be appended to that document rather than actually trying to uh, actively go in and insert it, but that the intent of what is being shared is is integrated and, and received. Yeah, that does sound better. If you could motion slightly. Is it up there? knew <laughs> you were just being pressed to leave. <laughs> All that work, I tell you. You've just been taken to the woodshed. <laughs> My apologies, I should warn so, you. So, uh, does staff have any um, technical reason why this can't? can or cannot be done? Not no. that I'm aware of. None. None, okay. So, movers, I think a seconder, Councillor Hill. Um, comment. Uh, Councillor Sank already said something. Does anybody else have anything to say? No? So, all Just those. Just as a, yeah. hate to be the matter of procedure, the motion still is not on the floor, so technically we can't oh. move the amendment till the actual motion. Yeah. So we can just get that and then move the amendment. Okay, so it's just leave it up there for the moment, yeah. okay? I'll read this, we'll get the motion on, and then we'll, uh, we'll amend it, okay, properly. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Okay, so that the Arts Recreation Community Policies Committee recommend to council that the Professional Development Working Group report as attached be endorsed. 
and that the report be considered by staff in the context of future priority setting and work planning. So do we do have a mover? Councillor Sanic, seconded by Councillor Hill. Okay, um, it's on the floor. You can, out of courtesy, I'm going to. Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, the of the recommendation that the report be considered by staff in the context of future priority setting and work planning. Can I just have staff um, uh, clarify or confirm or clarify this is staff priority setting? Because of course we've got the council priority setting coming up. You, Mr. Chair, that that is uh, that happening. This is in terms of staff planning, and uh, as Ms. Paul Baldwin referred to, uh, particularly in the context of a renewal of the Kingston Culture Plan upcoming, that this is something that we would take into consideration in that context. Okay, and uh, all I have to say about the recommendation. Sure. So this is basically to staff get permission to actually do the process that's necessary to do that, or if. You even think it's a good idea, and you haven't decided that yet, technically. Okay, okay. All right. Um, Councillor Asanic, now you can make your motion to amend. Okay. Well, I am moving an amendment, mm -hmm. which is up there, that the correspondence um, of the addendum be added to the working group report. Q and a second, there was Councillor Hill, right? So, uh, any comment of Councillor Stroud? Clerk, do we need to put um, in the first clause of the recommendation, professional development working group report as amended once, if it is amended, would the first clause need to be changed? Yeah, probably would be wise. So the amendment on that, since it's happening with this, but yes, that is correct. So thank you for pointing that out. So should we just put it on on here at the, uh, for clause one be amended to insert the words as amended? <laughs> yeah. That's fine. I think that's fine. Okay, so all those in favor of the amendment, it passes. Now we have the amended motion in front of us. Uh, we've got a mover. We've got a mover and second. So we got that moved and seconded. Just want to be sure. So all those in favor of the amended motion, passes. Good. Good. Okay, so now um, we're on to motions. Um, and then not seeing any, then notices of motion. On uh, 10 other business, I want to raise something with the, um, with the committee. In the last, uh, Councillor Dosanic knows about this. There's a series of emails based on um, concerns raised by people in the public about um, the Spark program, uh, the um, Kingston card. You were part of that, right? So I think, I'm just gonna bring it up right now and I'll talk with, with others. Like, we, we, we have these discount programs for people that are under the LECO, right? Like, it, it's quite low, it's 17,000 and a half crops, like. And uh, the question has come up, they would, certain seniors are not much above, like maybe $1,000, 18, four, 18, seven. They don't qualify. So it means some of the lower income vulnerable population cannot do some of the things they'd like to do because they don't comply, they don't qualify for the discounts. And I'm just wondering if the committee would be interested in looking at that again. We looked at it once, what, three years ago? Four years ago? And um, it, was, it was frightening, <laughs> okay, in terms of take. But yes, a comment there. Well, I believe uh, a report was presented to council in actually 2018 to consider uh, amendments to that. Um, and that was deferred by the former council. And it is fully the intention of staff, uh, not necessarily my department, but part of the community services group of departments 
to bring a report to council in the spring once Statistics Canada data is out for, because uh, a lot of the discussion is right now the MFAP program, the Municipal Fee Assistance Program is predicated on the LICO um, income, which is the low income cutoff, I think uh, is the acronym. And the, the discussion had been whether to move to a different measurement of income to d determine what, what would be low income. And I know that staff are awaiting Stats Canada to produce the 2018 numbers for that so that um, there can be a better discussion at council as to how to, how to move towards that. Right, and another measure that was discussed at the time was the low income measure, Correct. the LIM, right? Yeah. With those couple of people that, like I, Councillor Dor Doherty heard and I heard from a couple, the, would they have qualified even under the LIM? Do you know offhand? Yeah, I, I unfortunately, I, I wasn't involved in that original report. I don't know what the difference is, but I do know uh, that it adds, um, by going between the LICO to the LIM, it adds um, over a thousand households in Kingston. I just don't know what the number is, but it's in the thousands, uh, what the original calculations would be of more eligible households. Right. And um, that was just to remind the councillors that were there and uh, include Councillor Hill, that was based on a, 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 a programmatic change where people above a certain level who now qualify would not qualify. And that money that went to them would be redistributed below the, I guess you could call it the LICO plus line, whatever it was determined to be, or LIM line plus, LIM plus. So that's why it got deferred essentially, because it meant people who were seniors would not qualify anymore, who are still modestly income. So it's a question of scarce resources. So leaving that, um, I just wanted to bring it up, okay, and see how people, but if you are coming back, I didn't, I, was, I knew about that, I just wasn't quite sure whether it was actually coming back or not. Okay, so I will guess I'll wait for that and see what the story is. Now, there's no other, uh, we got the correspondence and we dealt with it. 12, the date, time of the next meeting is April 25th, 2019. And then there is something else really important. And that's the journey. I will miss the next meeting. And oh. if, if one of the other members will have to be here for a quorum, that is my 50th birthday. Is it? Well, a big congratulations. I, I don't know if there's a reward or not, because I didn't notice any. I, I, don't, I don't think Councillor Hill and I saw that coming. You know, we, did, we didn't get anything. Oh, sure, let's do that, let's, let's do that, let's do that. <laughs> it only happens for Sydenham District. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> Get well soon. <laughs> okay, so um, anyway, we are still at a German. <laughs> Can I get a mover, Councillor Hill, he, he likes this one. And Councillor Sanic also likes it. Okay, so it's, Moved and seconded. All those in favor of adjournment? Passed.